Our next presenter tonight is Joe Piazza. Joe is going to present on replicating a Westside lumber log truck in HO scale using 3D printing. Uh, Joe, like many of us, uh, began building military models as a youngster. In high school, he got his hands on a brochure from the Westside Lumber and Cherry Valley Railroad. A trip to Tuolumne gave him his first close-up look at a shea. He was hooked. The West Side and all of its unique equipment have been his uh, passion since. Over 30 years of intense research has allowed him to develop a significant body of material on all the trucks, cats, and other auxiliary vehicles. So tonight he's going to discuss with us some of those vehicles and, and in particular, one logging truck he is building using 3D printing. So Joe, welcome. Let's hear from you. Thanks. One second. Can you guys see that? Yes. All right. When you're modeling the west side, the first thing you're usually attracted to is the shays. And even if you're not a west side modeler, you might have one of these. If you get a little further uh, into it, you're gonna get a connected log car to add to the train. Then you might add one of the uh, colorful pieces of rolling stock they had, such as the uh, box car or that gas car there. Then you're gonna need to have a caboose to bring up the end. If you go a little further and you decide to actually build a layout, then you're gonna need a bit more. And so you definitely need Tuolumne. So in Tuolumne, you would be modeling the north end, of course, and this is what uh, Bob, Cole, Bob Poley modeled so beautifully in his presentation last month. So this is the north end of the yard with the fuel oil facility, the Jitney shed, and then you've also got the sand uh, house back here. Uh, further to the south, you've got the uh, car shop here and then the old engine house as well as the carpentry shop and then you've got the uh, the warehouses and the Y and then you've got the log dump here with all the uh, interesting things going on with the uh, sinker um, boom here and the all these other structures and as well as these vehicles here and if you have a lot of room you can actually model part of the mill um, you do need a source of logs for this operation, so you need to model camps. So uh, here's one example of a camp. This was Camp 8, and this is what I model. I modeled 1951 when there was a large fire called the Wrights Creek Burn, which uh, resulted in the line being pulled back to one of the earlier camps, Camp 8, and they set up a transfer uh, operation here so that they could uh, salvage the logs from the fire. And this in the foreground is the truck road where the trucks would come up and there was a loop in here and they would dump into this area. And then this uh, diesel loader, which was originally steam powered, but converted to uh, Jimmy diesel, was used to then transfer the logs onto the log cars. And, that they, and in this case, they actually used the main as the loading track during that year before they went back to Camp 45. Then of course we had Camp 45, which is probably the most famous camp. Again, you, here's another transfer scene. You can see uh, the, uh, Peterbilt three, model 380 pulling in to the landing and Alex Ness here operating the last uh, steam loader that they operated on the west side. And there's also a Peterbilt 354 DT behind the uh, these sheds in the background. Then finally in 58, here we see all kinds of activity. This is Buffalo Landing. Um, here we've got three trucks lined up. This is a 380, uh, this is a, a 354 DT and another 354 DT. Again, they're using the diesel loader to do the transfer from truck to rail. Um, so one element that's very obvious here that you need if you're gonna model a scene like this is a truck. And the problem has been there's never really been any real kits that have replicated that. I did make an early attempt and I'll show that to you right now. This was, my earliest attempt about 30 years ago, this was a Leetown Mac, which I kind of converted into, give it the feel of the West Side 
Peterbilt. Uh, so I did uh, replicate, you know, a lot of the details like the bumper and this, uh, the Peterbilt guard here, um, the Reliance cab guard and the um, Reliance trailer. I did upgrade this model a bit for the, my uh, Gazette article. Um, so in, our, in the intervening 30 years, I've learned a lot. I've become kind of an expert on the West side and the question kind of arose now, could I do better than what I did 30 years ago? You know, I'd done all the research. Um, I knew what was wrong there. Um, also, I thought that my, my modeling skills might be up to the challenge. And finally, I had uh, I'd committed to a lot of friends since I'd done all this research and I was probably the only one that could ever do this um, that I should pursue this. So based on that peer pressure, I uh, made an attempt to um, do that. And to answer the question, could I do better? Yes, I could. So, but before we go into how I created this, let's talk about some historical context in regards to the prototype. So, is this in the way here? The sharing screen? No. No, okay, that's just me. Okay, so um, the primary units that the Westside had or manufacturer was Peterbilt. They had 15 units by 1954, um, the first of which were acquired in 1943, which significantly altered the operation there. Um, previous to that, there was no truck operations, which is actually 43 is kind of late, but uh, that did alter it significantly. So they got five units there. These had um, 216 and a half inch wheelbase. They had uh, the Cummins 6 HB engine, which was a whopping 125 horsepower, uh, 1122 tires, a channel wood filled bumper, the Peterbilt uh, drive shaft brake, which is similar to a true stop brake, um, two 45 gallon fuel tanks, 10 foot bunks with Reliance cab guards, and they were painted um, with uh, the letter, uh, le ah, excuse me, the lettering, um, they were painted synthetic blue, west side synthetic blue with black fenders and gray wheels and aluminum lettering, which stated aluminum, oh, sorry, west side lumber company Tuolumne. And they also included the number. Um, this is a view of those original five trucks at Connell Motor Company in Stockton, California. This was the first Peterbilt dealership in the west coast, I believe. And here you can see the five trucks all lined up for their builder's photo here. And then uh, here are four trucks as delivered in Tuolumne. This is Shed 11, also known as the um, Big Green Shed. And uh, we're missing one truck. I don't know what happened to it, but uh, maybe it broke down on the way up. Um, here's uh, a view of what uh, number 21 looked like. Um, as you can see here, you know, as if you've been in the Sierras, you know how hot it gets in the summer and these trucks probably overheated a great deal. So they took the hood sides off. Notice the latches just kind of hang in there. They were put on um, in the winter. Um, and then uh, here's 21 in a later period. And this one's been, this is actually, I believe like 58. And what we can see here is they've modified it. They've uh, replaced the headlights. They've got a different bumper on it. These uh, units also had uh, vertical louvers, whereas the later models had horizontal louvers. And they've replaced the triple Donaldson air cleaners with this one large one here. Here's another view of that same truck on that same day in color. And there you can see, there's not that many color pictures of these, but you can see some of the interesting weathering effects that you could do here, like the mud in between the, the dualies here and definitely settling in here. A lot of chipping on the battery boxes as, long, as well as along the doors here. And then you can see all this discoloration here on the bumper. Here's number 22. This, uh, another feature of these early trucks that they had, they only, they came from with this Reliance cab guard, but only with these horizontal uh, members and then they welded on rail here. So there's what one, two, three, four, five pieces of rail, and then they had like a, an end strip attached here. And this truck also has been retrofitted to go to the to the truck dump. As you can see, there's a turn signal here and there's a commercial license plate here. It also has had its bumper replaced. And here's one of those uh, diesel loaders again. This is uh, near Camp 45. Here's uh, number 23. It looks like it might have been the very first year. Um, it's all buttoned up here. And then here's uh, 24 at, on, at Buffalo Landing. 
Um, here you can see it has that same cab guard. Some other interesting details are the water bag on the door, um, the lube refiner here. And this is all opened up and they've also changed the headlights out from those large Dietz type, type headlights to these more torpedo type ones and a different bumper. Um, this is about the only color image I have of those early trucks with that uh, west side synthetic blue. And uh, this was taken from, this is a snip from a video that shows some operation during, I believe, probably that first season in 43. So you can see the coloration there. Um, later in 44, they acquired uh, three more 354 DTs. Then in 45, they acquired two more. Well, actually in 45, they acquired two 355 DTs, which was a modernized version of the 354 DT. And these, um, per the spec sheet, were painted mandarin orange with black fenders. And then there was another 355 DT in 47. Then in 52, they acquired the more modern 380, um, numbers 31 and 32. They had a Cummins NHB engine, with a, which had 200 horsepower, 250-gallon fuel tanks, and they were painted Omaha orange with black fenders and a black stripe. And then two more were acquired in 53. Here's number 25. This is near, this is during the Camp 8 years, the John Cummings photo. Um, what's interesting here is this modification they did to some of these early trucks is they've added these snorkels here. So they punched a hole through the, through the hood and added these pre-cleaners. And um, so that makes for a kind of interesting detail. Here's a side view showing what, these, what this truck looked like in profile. Pretty nice load there, obviously posed with this guy standing here. And then here's number 27 with that similar um, modification. And here, I'm not, I can't see the numbers, but you can see these also have that modification here. This is Camp 44. This is the Camp before Camp 45. And here's another one of those loaders here, diesel loaders. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is Bill Burner, the wood superintendent. Um, I'm not sure if this is number 20 or 24. Um, but uh, here you can see an interesting detail for modeling is the headlight being kind of tweaked over to the side and then notice this load. This, this was for the uh, Tuolumne Jubilee and this was in 1950. And there's a series of photographs showing this log being transferred from the woods to, the, um, to town. And then here's uh, one of the 355 DTs, number 29. We can see this doesn't have the, this is actually from 44, and this is a 1944 bumper with the four holes here. And note that the cab guard is different here. It's got a wider cab guard with this angle iron here. And then this is number 30. Um, and this is that, that, that same log during that Jubilee parade. And uh, I believe this is, oh, I've interviewed this fellow. This was Floyd Brown. And then I believe this is Tom Carr, and I don't have the names for those right off the bat, but there's another um, difference here is they've got a slotted bumper here on this one. And then this is number 31. This is a, a 380 model. And what's interesting on the spec sheet was that this thing was originally going to be destined for Stockton Box Company. This is a, a, a whatever, a, a rendering of a Stockton Box truck. And it was painted red with some white trim. And in the spec sheet, they show the Stockton box is kind of scratched out and uh, it being rerouted to the west side. So I believe this is that truck. And here we've got, with that repaint, we have some paint failure here on the fenders. I've never seen that on any other pictures. So I believe that might be that truck. And then here's number 34. Um, get a good sense of what the three, how the 380 different from those 354 DTs. Here it has a turn signal here. So it could be used in town or to the town dump. And here you can see the chipping that occurs in the woods, right? You've got, and, and another interest, there's some chipping here on the fenders, on the wheels, and then on the battery boxes, steps. And then another interesting detail here is you can see that the paint is clean here along the edge of the door where the driver has been touching it because everything up in the Sierra gets covered with dust. Here's another uh, nice view at Camp 45 of number 34 with a side view. And then, uh, Beyond Peterbilt's, they also had some other trucks. They had a, a three Diamond T's, 950 RS's. Um, these were acquired in 1954. These had uh, 300 horsepower Cummins engines in them. And this 
You can see all three of them here in 1963 after operations have shut down in front of the truck shop. And here's one of the units there at the truck dump in Tuolumne. And they also had some war surplus engine uh, trucks. Um, they had two of these uh, Rio F1, seven and a half ton aircraft refueler trucks that were repurposed as log trucks, number 70 and 71, and they used Fabco Model 100 trailers. Uh, this is what one of those looked like. Can't tell the number. Um, again, they've removed the side of the hoods there, probably prevent ventilation. And actually this may have broken down because they've got it kind of peeled off, opened up here. Then notice that the door is open here. And I believe this is because if they had a runaway, they could just bail out without having to open the door. And this door comes off pretty easily. I think you just pull a couple of pins here and it comes off. And then uh, they also had uh, three of these two and a half ton trucks from the CCKW GMC series from World War II, um, numbers 64 through 66. They had models 88 Fabco trailers. Uh, no pictures that I've found on those so far. And uh, the primary trailer, as I mentioned earlier, was the the Reliance, they had 11 of those by 1954, and they were a model 450L, um, num numbers 40 through 50. Here's when they were acquired. And each axle was 25,000 pounds in capacity. The reach was eight by 10 by 20 feet. It had a walking beam suspension, um, two water tanks for cooling the brakes, um, larger tires, the 12 by 24s, and they were painted black with light gray wheels, and they also had 10 foot bunks. Uh, this is what, this is a uh, manufacturer's photo. I'm not sure if it's a 450L, but it is at the Reliance factory and it looks very similar to the details uh, that I know of. This is a trailer that I found um, in the Sierras just through Facebook, somebody posted it and I tracked it down and, and stuck my tape through the, the fence and it was able to get a lot of good dimensions and I based my model on this unit that I found out in the wood, well, actually just off the road. And then here's uh, another John Cummings photo showing how large those tires are uh, based on the scale of that gentleman sitting on the tire. And then this is kind of a cool picture. This is that same picture, same series of photos with that Jubilee log. What you can see here is that they've um, bound, and this is something I don't see modeled that often as they've bound this to the, just one binder or a wrapper to the bunk. And then they've left this open and then in the, at least in the west side, they'd use just a short section of chain, then a, a length of cable, and they'd toss it over there. And then, and then here you can see how they, this isn't a west side image, but you can see how they cinch those guys up. Typically, if they were, you're having a multi-log load, you would wrap them with two wrappers in the middle. You wouldn't attach them to the bunk, per se. But here you can see they're using a pipe as a cheater just to crank that thing shut. Um, the other trailers uh, were all Fabcos. Um, there were seven of them. So there were uh, three uh, Model 8s and four Model 100s. Have not been able to find a lot of documentation on the Fabco 100. So there's a, a period of advertising of what that would look like. This is a Model 88, which has a serial number very close to Westside, just within a few numbers. I think this is a pretty close match to what the Westside had behind those uh, two and a half ton trucks. And this is what the page trailers look like that went behind those diamond tees. And here's kind of your balance. As you can see, the Peterbilts were mostly matched up with Reliance 450Ls. Uh, the Model 380s had the Model 100s. The GMCs had the Fabco 88s. The Rio uh, 7.5 ton trucks had the Fabco 100s. And the Diamond T 950 RSs had the pages. So there was a lot of research to come up with all this information and reconcile everything together. Um, first, the histor historical research. Um, I uh, was fortunate to visit Russ Simpson many years ago, and he showed me the 1951 inventory uh, for the vehicle pages. And from that and over time, I was able to capture and view uh, 1935, 1940, 48, and 50, and through 54. I've actually got more data than that. So I was able to get serial numbers off of that because it included descriptions of and numbers of the vehicles plus serial numbers. Then there was also general ledger data that I was able to capture, Department 95. Um, there were several Lumberman articles that described these vehicles. Um, there was also gas books that documented when vehicles were actually active and whether they consumed fuel or not. 
did interviews with former employees to get better context to how these were used and acquired based on those original inventories, I was able to acquire the actual build sheets for the Peterbilt and Reliance truck uh, trailers. And uh, something that I got lucked into a couple years ago is that when the Peterbilt factory was moving from Newark, California to Denton, Texas, they tossed out all their engineering drawings, which was amounted to about 10,000 drawings. And a fellow, I believe that is a member of the Niles Canyon a railway um, and also a uh, an employee there rescued those from the dumpsters. So my friend now has those and I was able to use those and reconcile the build sheets to the actual parts that were used on the trucks because these trucks were all custom until the 1970s. So there's a number of parts for like fenders and everything. So it was hard to really discern what was what. And then of course, period advertising helped to kind of fill the gaps on some things. And there was also tons of field research. Once I had that historical research, also I had to find some actual trucks to measure to, to figure out how I was gonna model this. So uh, the key to this was the American Truck Historical Society. They have some great shows worth checking out. Just, it's just total blast, to, to, especially the national truck shows are just amazing. And they have a great magazine that has really great articles on the history of trucks. Um, so going to those shows, I always brought my tape measure, my camera, took lots of measurements and photos. And what I discovered is that even though a truck is restored, it may not be accurate. And I'll point some of the inaccuracies later in my model. And then of course, going there, just talking to people, you get to know people and build on that. And also sometimes it's just fun just to go out and drive around and just find stuff. And that's, that's just, I just enjoy just the hunt of the whole thing. And based on all that, I was able to locate these four trucks here. So what we have here is a, 1945 model 280 here and this uh, gentleman Don Podesta helped me measure up this truck and this was the basis of my cab measurements and a lot of lot of measurements for the trucks this is an actual 354 DT that I measured extensively at a show this one um, is actually owned by someone that lives five miles away and is the best restored Peterbilt that I've ever seen at any show it's a 344 DT very similar to the west side trucks very accurate. And then this is a 1940 Peterbilt with the egg crate, egg crate grill, but uh, a lot of the details on the frame are very similar to what uh, I was going to model. So then the question was, I got all this data. Well, how am I going to do this? So I could modify an existing model. There was, there's the IMEX model in HO, and I believe there's one in, in S scale, but uh, that wouldn't satisfy my O scale friends. And it would be a compromise because they're not 100% accurate. I could engage a professional, but doing that three scales would be hugely costly. I could learn how to machine, but again, I'd have to do it three times. And that, that wouldn't be very fun. And finally, the other option that has come into its own is 3D printing. So I had already investigated that extensively and decided that, that would be the way to go. So let's go through some of the steps that I went through to build this thing. So the first step is design. I initially learned Autodesk 123 design. It was a free software and started drawing this truck. I had drawn the trailer up first and, and put that through Shapeways. Um, then on the truck, I had started that and then they discontinued that. So I had to relearn Fusion 360, which has a huge learning curve, but is a much more powerful tool and made things a lot simpler. Um, I drew up individual components and then combined them into assemblies. So I would drop like bumpers, you know, fenders, all this stuff, and then eventually combine them into a full assembly. And there is the drawing, the rendering of, actually that's, yeah, that's a screen print of the drawing of the assembly for the multiple parts. So I'd have like a drawing of the, the suspension, for example, or the rear end for, sus ah, for example, <laughs> would be made up of multiple pieces, like the uh, springs, um, this support piece, the um, axles, and then they would all be combined together. And then here's uh, what level of detail you can get into. And I, I modeled every single thing that I could see in the photos. And these were actually, this, the dimensions for these were actually very difficult to attain on a completed vehicle, but I did, uh, I think I captured it pretty well. And the caveat here is that I modeled the wrong rear end. <laughs> this actually was a, a different, you know, I'd seen this on that 354 DT, but it actually was not the right rear end. So the one on the 1940 truck is actually the correct one. But so I just need to modify a few of these upper pieces to get it right. 
and then we get into the actual uh, printing process here. Um, you could use ser a service bureau such as Shapeways, and I did that with the trailer. However, I just did not like the cleaning process. Uh, all that wax support material was the real pain in, for me and uh, really drove me away from Shapeways. Also, doing I, I did some initial prints of the cab and the fender assembly, and that was $25 just on its own. So that was just going to be too costly for a whole truck. So then I decided to explore buying my own, and there was a lot of different options out there. Um, there were like the Moai, which was like a late, was an actual DLP type printer. But then what happened is all these cheap Chinese printers came online, which were creating these amazing details. I saw a lot of people creating figures with these and they were only like $300. So the price point got to the point where I said, let's just try it. So I pulled the trigger and bought an Elegoo Mars. And this is what it looks like. It's uh, basically the way this works is there's a vat here. It's got a clear window called a FEP. You fill this vat with resin. And then uh, what happens is this, when you hit print, this arm comes down on the Z axis, touches down on that FEP. And then there's a UV array here that will expose each layer one at a time. And then this arm goes up a little bit and pulls away from that. Basically, it's called a, a process called peeling. And it'll go back and it'll do that over and over again. And then magically a part will appear out of the goo. And some of my prints took almost 12 hours to do and we'll show those in a second here. So there's a few steps for prepping for printing. First you have to export that drawing to an STL, a stereolithograph format. Then you need then I imported into Process Slicer because it has a much a really nice support software to build the supports because you basically, if you can see the picture down here, you know it's building basically upside down, right? It's going to print going up this way. So you have to have a firm connection with the build plate or else the the print will fail and then these, this whole support structure gets thrown away, but it's supporting all these parts. And if anything's not supported, it'll fail. So it's very critical. That's the most critical step is learning how to support these parts. And so I typically auto-generate and then auto-generate the supports and then do some editing. You can edit each individual point. And then you export that image with, or that file with the supports as an STL. And then I import it into the Chi2Box software, which is the one that actually slices each little layer on the Z-axis into an individual layer and generates the G code that the printer understands. And then you can also adjust. There's all kinds of, there's tons of variables that you can adjust uh, for exposure and everything. And I'm using the Elegoo Mars uh, gray ABS-like resin in my printing. So then you save that sliced file to a thumb drive and then you actually go to the printing, you insert the thumb drive into the printer. Now they have, you know, ethernet cables. My, they advanced these printers quite a bit in the last few years. Now they have 4K type screens and everything. I think even 8K screens are coming on. I fill the vat with the resin, hit start, and then wait for a really long time. And then once the print is complete, remove the part from the build plate, clean it in mean green or in 90% isopropyl alcohol. I, I prefer the mean green, it seems to do a better job. Clean it further in an ultrasonic cleaner with mean green. I'll fill the ultrasonic cleaner with water and then stick the parts in a plastic baggie filled with mean green and then run that for about five minutes. And that does a bang up job of cleaning off the excess raisin. And then they remove the supports before the parts cure because if you cure them prior and try to remove them, it gets very brittle and you're probably gonna break something. It's pretty soft and malleable at that point. So it's easy to snip the parts. And then finally, you cure the part with a UV light, and I do it underwater. What I learned was that it gets a, a better, I guess, better refraction or something on the part. And I, when I was doing it not in the water, I was getting these the thin parts that I was modeling were actually breaking or cracking. And finally, this is uh, what you get. Um, so I don't know if this was the best thing to do, and this was a very painful process to... <laughs> remove this cocoon here, but you have to go into each one of these little supports and break and, you know, snap them or snip them off. And because of all the detail in this rear end, I mean, you can see this almost a solid mass of supports here. So this was quite an exercise to remove, but uh, once you got it removed, it looked like that. So um, there were multiple iterations and I'm still iterating through this thing. Um, what I just 
I tried to uh, print the tanks separately, but they were so small that it was better to actually have them print on the frame rail here. And uh, then another thing I attempted and noticed was that the like the uh, the side, hood side latches weren't really giving me the detail that I wanted. So I actually ended up doing them separately. And then I ended up doing the battery trays, which on the prototype, the door would open, fold down, and then you could actually pull the tray out and service the battery. So I ended up uh, making those as separate parts. So then, uh, then we get into the fun stuff. Once you get everything done is the painting. That, it's my favorite part. And so I use uh, Tamiya um, fine surface primer in a spray can, and that works great uh, for this application. Sand, it might take a couple applications. For the cab, I use Tamiya Royal Blue with a gloss to try to replicate that, uh, that deep blue that the West Side used. For the frame and the fenders, I used a base coat of Tamiya Red Brown and Flat Brown to give it kind of that primer slash rust look. Then I used the AK Interactive Worn Effects two coats. Um, then um, for the frame color, I used uh, Tamiya Flat Black with some gray added to kind of warm it up a little bit. And then I used uh, water and a small brush to chip the frame to expose some of that red brown. For the tires, I used Tamiya Sky Gray right, for the rims. And then Life Color, which makes an amazing rubber tire color. And then we get into even the, the part that I enjoy even more is weathering. Um, so for the cab, to break up that shiny blue, I did the oil dot mapping technique where I use Prussian blue, titanium white, and Payne's gray in dots. And then you, you dampen your brush just slightly and then kind of pull it down and it gives it a nice, interesting uh, texture and patina. And then I used uh, pin washes of ammo dark brown. And then I also did some brush chipping. On the frame, I did some brush refinement of the, the chipping and then used a pin wash of Amma Dark Brown, AKA Interactive Rust Wash for the suspension, um, streaking gray effects. And I also used the Amma Oil Brush for some dust effects. And then for the tires, uh, wheels, I used a pin wash as well as Prismacolor pencils and um, Ammo Africa dust pin wash as well as Ammo Oil Brusher. And then finally, I did a mud splatter with the ammo oil brusher. So finally, let's take a look at the model here. So this is the uh, the trailer. This was done on Shapeways with their uh, the finest FUD that they had there. Um, it's two pieces. The um, walking beam is one piece, and then well, actually, there's the, the bunks are a piece. Then the whole the the reach and the body are a piece. And then the and then the uh, walking beam is a piece, and then these are Ralph Ratcliffe wheels. Um, I used a uh, some Bragdon dust in a there's a combination that I documented in my um, Gazette article that I used in here to kind of fill in the dust because there's dust is covering everything there, and then did a lot of uh, chipping with brush there. Um, there's another view you can see the detail. This is the actual this is an actual catalog view of what that Reliance uh, walking beam looks like. And this is the rendered image. You can see I was actually able to get the brakes and all the linkages and for the drum brakes here modeled in 3D. Then here we go, here's the truck. This was all printed in one piece. Um, the, well, the battery uh, trays were separate pieces. You can see all the details able to yield with all the supports and retainers. All these uh, cross members are correct for this truck. Um, I was going to do photo etch for these uh, shields, the fuel tank shields, but I was able to actually print these. And, and one cool side effect is if you don't support these enough, they kind of warp a little bit. So I got a little battle damage just by luck there. Uh, and then there's the finished truck. Um, you can see all the chipping effects and the uh, here's some doors kind of banged up here. We got some chipping here. Here's those separate latches, which were very difficult to apply. Um, I was able to get the actual, uh, you can see here is the, the actual tow hook and the yoke were modeled and uh, see that. And then uh, there's a, this is an interesting thing that I only had two photos of this. This is their, their pencil was kind of a weird kind of assembly could, which could, uh, which was actually pinned to the trailer as opposed to a regular panel hook. So this was really difficult to figure out. Here you can see all the chipping here and the, there's the batteries in there with the door open. 
Oh, another thing here you can see, the full interior, that's one piece, including a scale, two scale Roth steering wheel. So everything, the whole cab is, including the dash and the steering wheel, one piece and the horn, I was able to get almost to scale in HO scale. And here's another view. You can see the interior a little better there. And there's another view of the interior. And here you can see some of the streaking and kind of the interesting effects you can do with the oils, with the dust effects here. And there's one final view with the combination. And this is still a work in progress. I still have a few parts left, but it's very close. And that's why I'm sharing it here. Finally, got to thank all the people that helped me along to figure this all out because it was not easy. Uh, Russ Simpson for saving all that material because if it was lost, there was no way I could have figured this out. Um, Tuolumne County Historical Society who has that entire Simpson collection. Uh, the Carlo M. De Ferrari archive, which has some other West Side materials. Uh, John Cummings and Tim McCartney, Art Cowpy, all my mentors helped me along the way, shared frequently. And then finally, Jim Vale, who wasn't necessarily a West Side guy, but he was certainly a vehicle modeler and uh, certainly showed us what could be done in HO scale. And then uh, here's uh, an image of the whole roster up to number 30. And you can see that they hadn't repainted all the trucks to orange yet. Here you can see these three are in blue. So these are the original, part of the original five. And then there's a couple colors in there. So that's kind of an interesting shot. And that is it. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Joe, uh, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but uh, this is just tiring thinking of all this work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was it was about three years, just the truck. Well, I mean, I didn't work on it all the time. I've got a day job and a family. But uh, yeah, there was the, just the truck took about three years of, you know, just research. And this is terrific. Iterating. So yeah. now you're going to build a fleet of these. Is that correct? Yes, I will build every model that you saw pictures of. And I have, you know, built a lot of the other parts for the other variations, the bumpers. And, and I'm also going to model the, uh, the, the Cummins engine so you can open it up and, and see the, I, I didn't show that, but I actually modeled the back of the firewall. So it has all the wire, wire harnesses and all the other pieces. And the back of the radiator actually is modeled too. So when you take those hoods, hood sides off, you could actually see all that detail. And I'm, I'm going to do it in S and O scale as well. That was the primary next question. Uh, is all of this scalable? Yes. So your work is going to translate into other scales. Yes, and it was. And what was cool about these printers is I drew that stuff to scale. I did not compromise very much. So it's all it should scale without having to alter it too significantly. I mean, there's always certain things, but I mean, I had to thicken up some things just to print in HO. So. Okay, a couple of questions. Um, are the support structures that you create reusable? Uh, not that I've found. <laughs> it's okay. Just, and, yeah. That that just gets broken into little pieces. You just cut them off and separate them and I toss them. But I guess you could use them for something. Use your imagination. Okay. Then the printer resin that's in the bottom of this unit, is that does that have a life? That is, how many times can you print theoretically, from a batch of resin? Well, I mean, it's all UV sensitive. I mean, that hood is a shield to keep the UV from curing it. But, you know, typically I'd put it back in the bottle. I wouldn't leave it out there. But I left it out for a week and, and reprinted, you know, printed multiple runs for a week and it was fine. You just have to kind of stir it, you know, agitate it, stir it up a bit um, to make sure it's thoroughly mixed. But I was able to squeeze... For a year, I was able just in a, just in all my R and D, I was able to get away with just using a twenty dollar bottle for an entire year, and I was printing wow. okay. you know, maybe once every <clears throat> few weeks. I mean, in the larger scales, you're going to be burning through more resin, but uh, right, yeah. Then a uh, question: What is chipping? Uh, well, I could do a whole clinic on on just <laughs> that, right? I mean, so I I follow a lot of modelers, military modelers on YouTube. And I mean, I'd probably leave it more to those, but basically the process is that you put down a, a base color that you want to chip to, you know, basically it's, it's when there's damage, right? And you're showing an underlying color. I can, let me just go back just to show that. Yep, I think I've. Let 
Let me just kind of burn through here. Well, actually, there we go. So this is chipping here, if you can see here. See where the paint has failed here, or it's been damaged? Certainly in log trucks here, so you see chipping along the edges. Typically, that's where you're going to see that is on the edge, right? So here on these battery boxes, there's a lot of, so some of this was hand done, some was done with the, so the process that I tried to describe, which is hard to, to describe without actually showing it is, so basically you would lay down this rust-like color here, right? Let that cure. Then there's um, both AK Interactive and Ammo of MIG offers something called a chipping fluid or worn effects. So you airbrush that in, you know, you put a coat down, cover whatever area you want to chip, let that dry, it dries very fast. Then you put another coat on there. Then immediately you apply your finished color. And then, um, and then you go in with a, you wet it, you put some water on it and it activates that, uh, that chipping material. And actually you can like peel the paint off of the top, exposing this underlying rust color. Wow. <clears throat> it's a very cool effect and I, I recommend, highly recommend you try that. It's, it's a, you can see it here you know, on the cab guard, which usually would get a lot of wear. You know, I did it up here, up here, here. That was all done with that technique. So that'll be a great clinic in 2022. Oh, okay. I'm writing this down. I, I have a question. I didn't see any evidence of winches on the fronts of these trucks. Was that just no. useless for them to even think about doing that? Well, the Peterbilt's didn't come with those. Probably the millet, the, the uh, two and a half ton trucks would probably yeah. have winches on them. Okay. If we can find some photos of those. Great. Well, those, I, are there any other questions real quick? Joe, thank you very much. This is a whole new or additional aspect to modeling the West Side.